Thanks for, for this opportunity to talk on Mike's first. Uh, Mike is my dear friend and colleague f over 33 years, I counted it. And I st still remember my first, our first encounter. He picked me up at the airport uh, of Chicago. It was late, but we went to a huge supermarket. Do you remember it? To, uh, to buy some food. And it was the first time in my life I visited this huge American supermarket. It was the first time in America. And at some point I noticed uh, huge shelves going over the horizon filled by uh, toilet paper <laughs> of all possible colors. And I asked Mike, why do you need here that, that many kinds of toilet paper? Because in Soviet Union at, at that time, there was only zero or one kind of paper, <laughs> mostly zero. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, oh, that's uh, uh, because they want to be noticed. These firms which uh, do it, they want to be noticed, and they produce the same, the same uh, toilet paper, with, but, but of different colors, and they fill big shelf space. And I thought, oh, maybe it's the strategy to survive here in science as well. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but uh, okay, I'm giving this talk maybe sixth or seventh time, but I never change colors of, of slides. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so it's about bootstrap um, and uh, in matrix models and Young Bill's theory. And uh, it's based on the papers uh, with my excellent PhD student, uh, Zechuan Zheng, uh, Zheng. Um, who taught me actually a lot about bootstrap, and I think this is the best kind of students who can teach you something. Okay, then why bootstrap? Um, Monte Carlo seems to be now the only universal systematic method to uh, to to solve to uh, to call, to compute functional integrals uh, in quantum field theory or matrix models unless you have some integrability, but in most of cases you don't have. But I think this situation is both practically and intellectually uh, not very, not very satisfactory. Uh, satisfactory. We have only one uh, method on the, on the market, uh, and as Mike taught me, there should be some competition. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, so Bootstrap opens a new more uh, way uh, to more analytic uh, approach and uh, it um, applies methods of optimization theory uh, providing rigorous inequalities on various physical quantities uh, sometimes very compelling uh, inequalities if you're lucky so it's applicable to a large uh, variety of multiple and functional integrals so it's quite universal as a method uh, and it's greatly inspired, our work is greatly inspired by conformal and S matrix bootstrap, where I cited the founding papers. But uh, uh, so later, uh, uh, also people started working on multi matrix integrals, and uh, I will tell our, I will speak about our work a little bit uh, on it. And uh, uh, Eventually, the most interesting part of our work is about uh, lattice young mills theory, and I think it's a new hope for, for alternative to Monte Carlo. That's why I got excited about this method. Um, it, in this case, it combines McCain Comigdal loop equations and uh, positivity of certain correlation matrix, enforcing the unitarity of your variables. Um, Today I will speak about, uh, I will give a brief review of our bootstrap study of, of a two matrix model. Uh, so it's a heat uh, warm up before passing to the next topic, uh, where I explain in, in detail the methods and results of bootstrap study of lattice young wheels theory in two, three, and four dimensions, and compare to Monte Carlo and perturbation theory. And the results I hope to convince you are quite encouraging although you can consider them as preliminary. Okay, um, so bootstrap in, in for two matrix model. Suppose I give a particular example of two matrix model, uh, but with the action where the interaction is commutators. So two, you have two Hermitian matrices, you take n, n by n matrices, uh, and the potential here 
is uh, this kind of young mills type potential commutator square of AB plus quartic potentials for both matrices. Uh, in the large n Toft limit, which we'll consider, and which Mike worked a lot. Uh,
becomes very and here and the result we get is six digit with six digits precision for our maximal L max equals 22 uh, our cutoff of length uh, you see that's a there is the, the results for these two for this point on the diagram uh, again I stress that this is exact these are exact inequalities so we are uh, we are sure that the exact result uh, lies between these numbers. By construction, we use loop equations which are exact, which simply drop some loop equations because they contain longer loops. Uh, and also our inequalities are, uh, are exact because we have... Uh, uh, we simply use the pos positivity condition which is exact. So uh, our, the equalities are exact, and increasing L max, we can only improve the margins. Now we can, uh, uh, it's still within the capability of a, of a single lab, a good laptop, like 40 hours of CPU time, and it can be even improved, as, as the Chuan tells me now. Um, uh, then we can compare it to Monte Carlo uh, due to this work, which, uh, uh, Rog Avgoin uh, has done speci specially to compare with our results. And you see, uh, by 80 hours of Monte Carlo run, you only get four digits, which is, uh, I think, to get two digits more, uh, you can un you understand that it's much more of CPU time, it takes much more of CPU time. Okay, so uh, just to show you that in many cases, Bootstrap can compete with, with, uh, 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 with Monte Carlo. Okay, that's it for the matrix model. Now, so if there are some questions, uh, it's here. Uh, now we uh, come to the main subject of the talk, bootstrap for lattice young mills theory at infinite n. Um, so in the Toft limit. Uh, so we solved McKay and Kumigdal equations for Wilson loops of length less than L max, the same idea on the lattice, uh, supplemented by uh, various conditions, positive pos positivity, which I explained on the matrix model, but also reflection positivity, which I will explain, of related uh, correlation matrices. Uh, and mostly it's an, it enforces, or maybe it's only to enforce the unitarity of gauge variables, which is lost when you cut off uh, uh, the number of equations. Uh, then a relaxation method, which I mentioned, but I will explain it in detail. Uh, and also the use of lattice symmetry, just the fact that we are on the cubic lattice and there are various discrete symmetries also enormously simplifies um, our bootstrap. Uh, and then we get uh, rigorous bounds on various physical uh, Wilson loops. And in particular, we discuss the plaquette average, which is the standard uh, first quantity to, to 
to uh, to find on the lattice, say in Monte Carlo. So we have a lot of material to compare from Monte Carlo. Okay, and uh, first I explain my Kane Kumigdal equations. Uh, uh, so we work with Wilson action, which is just sum over plaquette variables on the lattice. So you have link variable on the uh, you, on which is on the group S U N C, the group uh, color group variable. Uh, then the plaquette is simply the product of four. The plaquette variable is the product of four links around the plaquette, and then you take trace here, um, and lambda will be our coupling. The normalization and seek is taken in the standard way here due to tof, in the Toft limit to make everything else, uh, all the couplings um, uh, finite in the larger limit. Okay, then uh, like at average I defined already, UP will be standard notation, please note it for plaquette average. And uh, then we study Wilson loops, we bootstrap uh, Loop Wilson uh, McDowell equation on the space of Wilson loops, like the one presented here, the product of link variables along the uh, a path on the lattice. Uh, so this WC satisfies uh, McCain McDowell loop equations, also kind of Schwinger Dyson equations uh, obtained via. Uh, for example, right shift uh, of uh, this unity matrix on on any link, and um, it's the same as derivative on the group, so it's the same as in matrix model essentially. And you get loop equation in uh, this McCain-McDowell form, where on the left hand side you have the result of variation of the action, and on the right hand side uh, this variation acts on the uh, on the product of use inside the Wilson loop and splits it into two loops and also into two tr traces, into two sm Wilson averages for smaller loops. Uh, schematically, uh, if you have a link on your loop uh, and you vary it, you just add plaquette going this way, plaquette going there, that way, there are both orientations. Uh, and on the right hand side, uh, if this link uh, is uh, coincides with some other link uh, on your loop. It splits into two loops. These are that way, depending on whether they are parallel or anti parallel. Okay, this is uh, schematically, but even quite precisely, the description of McCain Comingdahl loop equations. Of course, we have factorization uh, here. We have wor work in the larger limit. And uh, now there are some slightly different kind of equation, which we call backtrack loop equations. Uh, same mccain comigal equations, but uh, uh, we apply the following backtrack identity on Wilson averages. You, you know that if you, you add to the to the, your Wilson loop a contour, like tree-like contour, uh, which is tracing itself back, uh, you get the same contour, because essentially due to unitarity you insert just unity. You can eat out this contour like cancelling pair by pair this U and U daggers. Okay, but uh, what you can do, you can now vary, you can do backtrack and vary some end, uh, end link, uh, one of the end links uh, on this backtrack contour and you get new equations. For example, if you take the plaquette and if you do backtrack like this and back and uh, add this backtracking path here, you can vary uh, the backtrack part, part of this plaquette and you get a non-trivial equation. On the left hand side you, you have, it's a two-dimensional example, but in three and four dimensions it's almost the same. On the right hand side you get a non-linear term, product of your plaquette, UP uh, average and the double plaquette average. Uh, okay, so these equations are written this kind of equations, both on the previous slide and, and these backtrack equations, are written all possible equations we write uh, on all possible Wilson loops uh, with the length which is which doesn't exceed L max. There, there is of course a huge number of both loops and equations, and uh, many more loops than equations as in the matrix model. And there are no clear boundary conditions in this complicated loop space, so we have to do something with it to 
complete the information. And we impose instead a few positivity conditions in the spirit of what I explained in the matrix model, but there will be details which I will uh, sp uh, explain in, in the following. Uh, so just to give you some idea of the scale of the problem, uh, for our best uh, result at Lmax equals 16, uh, for 3, 3D and 4D, uh, the backtrack loop equations con constitute more than 80% of all loop equations, so there is enormous amount. It's a, it's a very important, sorry, where I am. It's a very important <coughs> additional information. Uh, and um, uh, then there are about 40,000 loop equations in 3D and about 100,000 in 4D. Uh, around three quarters of them are independent, otherwise they are linearly dependent sometimes. And only a small amount is nonlinear. It's for this length, there are very few nonlinear equations, although they are important. Um, okay, then positivity, similar to the matrix model. Uh, we do the following. We take uh, Wilson paths on the lattice going from zero to X, all possible paths with the length which doesn't exist one, ho one, ho one half of Lmax uh, of our cutoff. And then we form the following operator. Uh, it's linear sum with arbitrary coefficients of, this, uh, of all possible paths each with its own coefficient. Then we do, uh, then we define again the positive definite quadratic form by taking all dagger trace and average it. So this quadratic form is positive and it consists of uh, the following matrix elements. They are single trace correlators between psi of ci and psi j. It should be dagger here. Uh, yes, dagger is here, but it should be here. So you take uh, so what is this quantity? It's W of Cj, uh, Ci bar, reverse part, times uh, Cj, a, a normal Wilson loop consisting of the contour Cj going this way, and then we come back along Ci in the opposite direction. So this matrix of such elements is positive definite. So for finite Lmax, we have finite, a finite matrix. Uh, example, uh, if we take L max equals two plus two. Our paths are equal uh, are of length two. And suppose we consider the path from zero zero to one one. So there is a path uh, going this way, and there is a path going th that way around the plaquette. If you uh, if you write the correlation matrix, you will have one on the diagonal because it backtracks. It goes this way and then backtracks here. Uh, according to that. And here you have just plaquette average. So at the end you get the positivity on, on plaquette squared, which is of course a unitarity constraint because we average a quantity which is smaller than one, uh, the unitary variable. Um, for our best data, we take paths only going from zero to zero. Like our correlations consist of paths CI going here and paths CJ C uh, completing it to the same point zero. For L max equal, equals infinity, uh, this would ex ex uh, exhaust all constraints. So we don't, uh, it's always like our algorithm, algorithm should work uh, exactly and perfectly when L max goes to infinity. Uh, why? Because, uh, because of backtracks, uh, you'll get all possible contours. Like if this contour would go the same way as this, this part will cancel and you'll get arbitrary contours this way. Um, but uh, even for L max equals 16, it worked very well for us. And we noticed that uh, d trying different x from zero doesn't improve much the precision of our uh, inequalities. Okay, so this is positivity. Another ingredient uh, is the reflection positivity of correlations. Um, so, there are three types of reflection symmetry on the lattice. Uh, uh, so, you can put a plane on the lattice, on the cubic lattice, uh, going through a particular side, or, or I mean, two lines, uh, uh, just one, 
one two dimensional plane and uh, this the action and the measure are symmetric with this with respect to reflection over this uh, surf, uh, with respect to this uh, this plane with maybe change u to u daggers of all variables but the contour if you choose the contour like c j here it will flip to the to uh, down to the down the surface and theta c theta is reflection will be already here so you have similar story about uh, site uh, about link reflection then the surface goes in the middle of the link and also diagonal reflection we have we used of course all of them all the information I, we have and then you uh, combine uh, then you mm, uh, concoct here the um, reflection matrix uh, which is the product of c ice and c reflected cj which appears it's really easy to convince yourself that it's also positive definite matrix uh, uh, so for example here is such a contour you have reflected c, c, cj and it, it is completed by ci going here so the whole contour gives you a wilson average which uh, enters this matrix it's a matrix element there uh, and uh, Positivity means that this matrix is again positive definite. Another set of three constraints. Um, it, those are conditions different from just positivity of correlation matrix, which I explained on the previous slide, and appears to be very efficient and very important here. Okay, so this is about reflection positivity and uh, where is I lost here some sorry some transparency important transparency about Ah. This transparency was important. It's about relaxation matrix, our relaxation method. So sorry. What's that? Sorry about it, maybe. I will show it this way. Uh, so, as I said, nonlinear equations are not good for uh, for semi-definite programming of such huge scale program uh, pro problem. And uh, then we transform uh, our nonlinear loop equations to some linear relations plus uh, convex inequalities. In the following. Uh, simple way. So in the right hand side of loop equations there are products of Wilson loops like W, P, W, Q and we replace them by single variable X, P, Q everywhere in the loop equations. So the loop equations be we have more of variables and the loop equations become by this naive procedure linear already. But we have to constrain somehow this uh, axis to, uh, to remind that uh, that uh, after all they should factorize into loop uh, loop averages and then we uh, don't know what happened then we um, uh, impose the following posi posi uh, the, pol the following relaxation condition which the Joan found somewhere in the literature of, uh, in the bootstrap literature and actually which is used also in conformal bootstrap we fix the we find uh, we uh, form the following matrix in the uh, here in the line you have and in the column you have all the whole set of our Wilson loops all our Wilson averages uh, up to I mean those which are up to the length L max. Uh, and in the middle we put a block of this XPQ, these new variables. And then we impose the positive definiteness of this 
matrix of this uh, relaxation matrix. Why do we do it? We don't still understand very well and uh, we couldn't find in the literature good explanation. Maybe the only uh, important observation is that at when XPQ factorizes into WPWQ, Q, uh, this matrix becomes of rank, rank 1. All eigenvalues are 0, but 1, which of course is positive. positive. Uh, so in some sense, uh, this manifold has uh, the most singular point at, uh, at this factorized uh, value. So it's always a sort of a, a king, how it's called, um, uh, uh, when we draw the picture of this manifold, it's always some very singular point, uh, a cusp. Hmm? Apex. Apex, maybe, yeah. Thank you. Uh, where the system wants to, to be. And actually, we notice that many of our loop, uh, of our XPQs really go to WPWQ. But I think it waits for mathematicians this problem to explain why it works so well. And it works indeed very well because we transformed our nonlinear, non-convex problem to a convex one, uh, much more efficient for any numerical SDP solvers. And some loss of information here we complete uh, by increasing the the N max, the cutoff. We checked it on the matrix models that it works very well. So it's something to use in Bootstrap. Okay, and this is the full description of uh, procedure. Now, ah, the, the final SDP algorithm. So it's now, it, it looks now as follows. So we minimize or maximize some linear combination of our Wilson loops. For example, it could be only plaquette average or a combination of plaquette and double plaquette, whatever you need for your physics. Uh, then we have a set of linear loop equations because we relaxed here. Uh, we, uh, instead of WPWQ, we put just XPQ, but we supplemented it by the relaxation condition, which I explained on the previous slide. Uh, uh, where this matrix consisting of x's and w's. Uh, and then there are a few positivity conditions. The main positivity condition, which is about unitarity of variables and three refraction conditions. Uh, all conditions are linear or convex now. And uh, at L, L max equals 16, every point uh, uh, took like 20 hours for uh, of CPU time for 4D on our quite powerful but still single uh, desktop computer and uh, only half an hour for 3D. And now, sorry, now there will be the results but I have to come to previous transparency. No, now I show the results indeed. Um, so we use this algorithm and uh, here are our results. First, in two dimensions, which was just a trial uh, to show that the, the method works. But we took not just a one plaquette model, we took uh, rather the whole two dimensional lattice to try to approach, to bootstrap the exact result as close as possible. Exact solution is known, of course, uh, from, uh, uh, from um, uh, Gross, Witt, and Wadia. So it's a simple linear function here, this dotted line, linear function here, then the third order phase transition, and you have this uh, uh, hyperbola. Uh, and uh, so you see that uh, if you take L max equals eight, the, our, our island covers this part, so it's not a good approximation. Only eight, of course, it's too small, uh, L, L max. So there is no lower limit, for example, only upper limit. Uh, now, if we take 12 already, we have, oh, there are two orange lines which are completely lost in these colors. So, it's time probably to change the, <laughs> the projector. Mm, or to change windows to Mac, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and then these blue lines are, are our best result at L equals 16 which are already quite close uh, to exact result, although you can uh, judge yourself whether it's close or not. It's all in this, uh, drawn in the right scale. 
Okay, but uh, then we go to to the three-dimensional case. Again, many lines here are lost. You you hardly see this. Uh, so again, yellow area is in max equals uh, eight. Then we have like two lines here. <laughs> That's terrible. At least blue lines are visible. It's good because they are, they are the best. Uh, there are always upper and lower limit, and we have this. Uh, may I try. So, the the so it's three dimensional case, dotted lines here and no, it's four dimensional already. No, three dimensional. Okay, three. Uh, so, the dots are here Monte Carlo data, and of course our results, the upper and lower limits. Uh, uh, are over or uh, or above uh, this Monte Carlo data. So these blue lines are our best result. This blue line is upper limit and uh, the, another blue line is lower limit. Of course, Monte Carlo is in between. Again, it works uh, for sufficiently strong couplings uh, it or sufficiently small. Here is the coupling. This, this is a plaquette average. Uh, it works quite well. Of course, somewhere near the phase transition or uh, crossover. I don't remember. Probably it's a crossover area from weak to strong coupling regime. It works worse. Um, and then uh, our main result comes, which is about four-dimensional QCD, already very interesting physically very interesting case. And here we see, fortunately, we, okay, there are, uh, you see, there is a quite a fast approach of, uh, to Monte Carlo data, which are again seen here by red dots, or a part of it, a bit more ex precise uh, uh, results are by black dots. Uh, so we see a quick approach uh, to the Monte Carlo data when we increase LMAX from 8 to 12 to 16. Blue lines are our best results. And you see that, uh, so, this, so this dotted line is a strong coupling line due to uh, strong coupling expansion worked out once by Druff and Jean Bernard. Um, then there, are, there is three loop perturbation theory known, which is quite a remarkable result. The three loops here are very difficult to compute. Uh, there are three, three loop results is known, which goes like that here along this dotted line. And then, uh, okay, there are some data, which maybe we don't care now, but it could be discussed because uh, at very weak coupling, uh, I think uh, it works already better or at least as good. Bootstrap works at least as good as Lattice. Mm. And actually, the bootstrap results um, also, uh, so the bootstrap results given by these blue lines work well in the following sense, that uh, the lower limit uh, is quite close to the uh, to the strong coupling part of this graph, and upper limit actually is very close to up to this phase transition area uh, is very close to the Monte Carlo. Uh, but also, what is really remarkable, it follows, it continues even beyond phase transition, and it follows closely the uh, three-loop perturbation theory which is, I think, an interesting phenomenon. So maybe it can be explained in the following, that the, our lower limit, so since you have the here first order phase transition, it's known to have first order phase transition, maybe we get just two different branches of solutions of loop equations. One is uh, weak coupling, and then you, you can continue analytically. Our method is sort of analytic. analytic. You can continue analytically beyond the phase transition uh, that explain why, explains why we follow here the perturbation theory quite closely, and maybe similar the similar about this uh, lower branch. So I don't know. Maybe there is a, this uh, hysteresis phenomenon here, but we are not sure. We want to compute increase Lmax to see whether we will uh, be closer and closer to. 
to this part of the graph, uh, our bootstrap result. Okay, and uh, then the last, um, the last thing I wanted to tell you about is that, uh, notice, uh, since we noticed that uh, our bootstrap here, the upper limit is so close to perturbation theory, it literally follows it. Uh, you cannot distinguish it on the, I mean, uh, with your eyes, only with digits, uh, that they are a little different. So it's natural to subtract from our result, which is supposed to be a sort of uh, some approximation to exact result, uh, subtract a perturbation theory and get non-perturbative corrections. Uh, because, uh, and this is, a, this is what is about the next transparency, uh, this is an attempt to measure non-perturbative effects for gluon condensate, trace f mu nu squared. Because you know that if you expand plaquette into uh, yeah, plaquette into um, in the limit of small uh, lattice length, you get f mu nu squared, trace f mu nu squared precisely, the first uh, term of fourth dimension which comes out the action. But of course, in, on the lattice it contains all this. Uh, perturbative uh, uh, garbage, if you subtract it, you might think that you measure condensate. And what happens here, unfortunately, again, it's not very visible, but these are, this is what appears to, uh, in this difference. We, we, we show here this difference. So we have uh, our uh, bootstrap, computed on bootstrap, points here. Uh, here we t take one over lambda scale, uh, one over lambda instead of lambda, you'll see why. And uh, then we uh, interpolated the curve by standard methods, like you take it from Mathematica, and the curve is quite nice. Now this part is the weak coupling part, which is very smooth and nice. And then you go over the phase transition and somewhere uh, here you lose positivity, which is already saying that uh, perturbation theory is not applicable, but you go slightly beyond the phase transition to the strong coupling phase, and you don't follow, by some reasons, the Monte Carlo line here. Uh, okay, and then uh, uh, Maxim uh, Chernodub, who noticed the, our results and said that it reminds him something, uh, he uh, proposed to compare it to finite temperature Monte Carlo data, um, which actually uh, calculates the conformal anomaly. Uh, and so what, what is done here, again, it's not very visible. I don't know how to. So we actually plotted, uh, he plotted uh, our, uh, our curve, this curve, but uh, by rescaling it slightly in both directions. Um, and the curve, which is the conformal anomaly, T mu mu, which is, sorry, it's not visible, epsilon minus 3p, the trace of uh, energy, stress energy tensor, which is computed like beta function times uh, delta, so do I have it here, times, uh, uh, the following quantity, it's delta up, small delta, which uh, is n4, it's the, so you, you work on the lattice with n4 links on the time direction uh, in, on the lattice, and you compute first zero temperature plaquette and then subtract the plaquette for finite temperature. And you can vary temperature by varying the constant lambda and uh, already in the 90s, uh, Boyd et al. Uh, found the following points here. The, the, the following. Uh, so these points are from the lattice SU3 theory. And by just playing with three parameters, you completely interpose uh, with great accuracy uh, like 27 points of our bootstrap result with the inter, in, interpolated by this line with this conformal anomaly at finite temperature. Uh, and uh, this is mysteriously, this is working mysteriously well, both 
you can say that both uh, uh, curves are about measuring trace f menu squared. And so maybe we are at the point of at least trying to compute the, yeah, I'm, it's finished more or less, uh, this um, uh, condensates. So our curve is at finite temperature and on infinite lattice, but, but with the uh, uh, cutoff on the length of the Wilson loops, which is our uh, IR cutoff more or less. But uh, Boyd et al. computed it on, uh, of course, on uh, the completely periodic lattice with time dimension, which is much smaller than space dimensions to, ma to make the temperature finite. And uh, it's, uh, it should be something beh behind this result. Uh, that uh, this curve coincide 27 points with three parameters. Uh, this is this doesn't happen accidentally usually. Uh, okay, and uh, our um, maybe our curve shouldn't be trusted too much uh, close to the phase transition. And usually people measure all this physical stuff like masses, string tension near not far from the phase transition and we have to work more or maybe we are finding uh, a real true branch of solution and it will not uh, approach so much to Monte Carlo data. Both, uh, both uh, events are possible. We have to work more and increase uh, the size of our, uh, I mean, the cutoff to see what happens. And now basic open questions and future problems. Uh, so it's like questions, can we beat Monte Carlo for d equals three and four in precision? The next step is to try 20 and 24. 20 is certainly possible. Uh, <laughs> uh, we work with Zichon on it. 24 is uh, theoretically possible, but on supercomputer and there are various technical problems, which I will not speak about. And Zichuan is much better specialist in it. And um, then can we apply machine learning to say something about uh, longer loops? Because it's an ideal, it seems to me, I know not much about machine learning, but it seems to me that the problem is posed in a perfect way. Like you have words, the numbers uh, attached to these words, and you want to notice what happens to longer words, what numbers are attached to these longer words. Who knows, maybe it could work, maybe since Mike is going in this direction, I guess, of machine learning and artificial intellect, maybe he, he can suggest something. Uh, then one or other corrections. This is a linear problem which can work very well, which actually could work very well, uh, because as you know, for any perturbation theory, every next, you solve the nonlinear, uh, zero order approximation, then all the other approximations are linear. The same about loop equations, although the positivity conditions might be more complex and uh, so it's not clear, but it's possible in principle to do one or n. And in n equals four, f, n equals four, and then in n, uh, in uh, Young Mills, uh, uh, many believe that uh, nc equals three is already very close close to nc infinity. So one or n correction may do the job for in, in most of the cases uh, for many interesting physical quantities. I mean, the real measurements of physical quantities. Uh, okay, uh, maybe finite n bootstrap is also possible, but uh, as you see, you have, you are now in the multi-loop space, which is much more complex. Uh, so you, you hardly can hope to reach even our lengths like L equals 16. On the other hand, there are many relations between Wilson averages uh, at finite n. So who knows, maybe it's also possible. Uh, then quarks are the next possible step because at large and limit, there are no internal quark loops. We have only to sum up our Wilson loops, which average which is found, which we found with the uh, certain spinorial factor, yes, which we know that like, projectors, product of projectors along the line, uh, along the Wilson line. So I think it will be easier to, here to measure the, the uh, meson masses than, um, than, for example, the global masses. 
the global masses need the uh, next one or an approximation like loop loop correlator, which seems to be already quite complicated for us. We we want to have very short loops. <laughs> uh, uh, and also quark condensate is quite an interesting problem, which is probably the most accessible here. Uh, then there are many applications for other problems which might work, for example, better in Monte Carlo or here or vice versa, one has to choose. Uh, for example, people say that finite chemical potential is a terrible problem for Monte Carlo. The results are very bad. And here, I think we don't have this particular obstacle. Uh, okay, then there is a more general question, I think, uh, uh, and important question. Uh, it comes from practical question. What loop equations are independent? We saw that many of our loop equations are dependent. But uh, how to work in the, uh, how to define the gauge theory in the loop space and how work there, how to work there. So it's both theoretical and practical question. Thank you very much and uh, congratulations, Mike. Happy birthday. a lot of questions, especially if, if when you do fermions, you can, you can get a lot of uh, qualitative questions. Uh, just an, another one that I was curious, I mean, you, you, you use a whole set of loops up to some uh, length of you know, left the loop. Mm -hmm. but, uh, suppose you wanted data about you know, even larger loops, and then you just took a small subset, you know, so you go up to L as a uh, you know, thousand, but you don't, obviously can't keep all those loops. You mean, I take, say, so loops. Suppose you want to test the area mm -hmm. line, you know, and you just have a small sampling. Of but uh, the loop equations don't close on such uh, yeah, loops, yes? Something. So you somehow, when you escape to a little higher uh, length of loops, you immediately have a lot of... Yeah. Yeah. Information which you, uh, I mean, you, you yeah, hardly can use partially. No, 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 no. You add one, you you add one more equation for longer loops. You have three loops more, yeah, for yeah. longer loops. Yeah. Then your bootstrap becomes less precise. But this is maybe the fundamental question: how to uh, how to find the relevant information which really is important uh, for bootstrap? Because Zichuan always tells me he observes that uh, many of these equations are garbage, uh, and, but you don't know which ones, uh, because uh, you, you need only two numbers, like <laughs> upper limit and lower limit, and maybe only one identity, a couple of uh, inequalities from this huge amount gives you, give you these limits, but... <laughs> uh, well, actually, uh, I, I wanted to, to ask the, the same, uh, Basically, the same question of uh, as Mike, but imagine uh, I, I mean the renormal group, renormalization group equation in the L uh, parameter. So, uh, of course, if you uh, consider L finite and then you you write your equations, you have a huge um, uh, number of equations we have to add. But just you uh, you take L and L plus one, and you consider this. Uh, can, can you write uh, kind of simpler uh, loop equations just for... Uh, to, to do a sort of uh, renormalization, yeah. renormalization group. Yeah. You want that? That's for, for us, the renormalization group. For young people, it's machine learning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but who knows, maybe. <laughs> maybe, but uh, you have to work out the... This would be already an approximation, I must say, because uh, what is nice about these methods, uh, the equali equalities you get are exact. You don't lose, you don't add any approximate information. Machine learning or, or a non group, of course, would give a pro some approximation, but uh, I, I'm open to any proposal. Maybe if, uh, you're right, maybe there is something in the, which can be done in terms of renormal group, but how to describe all this enormous number of loops. Actually, uh, th just one comment, maybe it's half a joke, but uh, when I 
learned that this method gives exact inequalities on physical quantities. I thought maybe this is the way to to earn clay pr uh, clay price for <laughs> for proving the confinement. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Could you say a little more about the 1 over n, or rather 1 over n squared corrections? You said that it would lead to linear programming? Uh, no, li linear, uh, it will be linear equations, linear first equation. of all, because <coughs> you solve